Upfront and outspoken with Bob Williams. If you love the Constitution, man is not free unless government is limited. If you love freedom, as government expands, liberty contracts. If you believe in personal responsibility, if you believe America is still the greatest nation on earth, then get ready for an experience you'll never forget. This is Upfront and Outspoken. Here's your host, Bob Williams. Thirty-five years of fighting in Vietnam are now ended. The president of South Vietnam has unconditionally surrendered to the Viet Cong. NBC Radio News, the fall of Saigon. This is Don Doak. Our reporter in Saigon, Jim Laurie, says the word the world has expected has come. The South Vietnamese government has given up. That is what we all heard 40 years ago today. Welcome, everyone. This is a very special and uh, very heartfelt edition of Upfront Outspoken. Today marks 40 years that Saigon fell, and you're going to be hearing from many of the recipients of the Medal of Honor. You're also going to be hearing a story from one of the nurses that were there. You're also going to be hearing a story from a flight surgeon uh, who also served during Vietnam. And I want to, how this all came about was that Art Martin, one of my listeners, brought it to my attention that Ed Freeman, a Medal of Honor winner, passed away just recently without any fanfare at all. A man who served his country went above and beyond the call of duty who should have garnered more than a small obituary. Ed's gone, but his words of that day back in 1965 will always remain. Here's Ed. I grew up in uh, South Mississippi on a farm. Nine kids. My interest was getting out of there. Uh, didn't graduate from high school. I uh, joined the Navy instead and spent two years. And at the end of that, in two years, I came back, went back to school, finished school, and uh, joined the Army. I went to Germany for four years. Uh, waited on the Russians to come across the line for four years. They never got around to it. And uh, the Korean War broke out, and I volunteered to go. And the Army gladly accepted my offer. The 14th of November, 1965, we uh, inserted a, uh, a, just short of a battalion of infantry, 1st of the 7th, into a little landing zone called LZ X-Ray. About half the size of a football field, surrounded by 250 foot trees, hardwood trees. There's a river called Air Drang right near it, and the Cambodian border gets to the other side of it. And we made four lifts into there without receiving the round of fire. Just, I saw another cakewalk here. On the fifth lift, they cut us in two. Just, there was uh, the three regiments come off the side of that hill. They were dug in. And the odds became to about 10 to one then. First, they was eating helicopters alive. I took 50-something 50, 50 rounds in my helicopter. All four of us were wounded. Then we get back to the staging area, and the colonel says, shut down all, all helicopter operators. You can't, you know, you can't survive coming in here. That lasted for about 45 minutes to an hour. He called and says, I need a volunteer to come back in and bring ammunition, water, medicine, and haul out my wounded. And I volunteered. And I was the only one. I was trying to bring ammunition and get those wounded people out of there in the meantime. And I was successful. I can't hardly describe the feeling that I had when uh, 
he hung that medal and took two paces back and saluted it's, uh, the President of the United States. And uh, it's just, a, it's a, you know, we all from kind of insignificant in that setting there. And then there were 50 of these guys with it already around their necks, sitting in the audience watching me, and uh, humbling effect. I, I didn't really feel that you should have finally gotten the medal. I, I, I was doing what I was supposed to do. I don't think it was a, never an option. I, I, I put them in there. And it's a soldier's trust. The Army had assigned me a helicopter that was a wonderful tool and I could make it talk. It was capable of doing what I was doing with it. And I wasn't about to, it'd be like refusing to fire your artillery piece if you were an artilleryman. The only thing I could have done was join them. That was the very least I could do. Because when you get in a situation like this, it isn't motherhood and the flag, no glory. It's you and your buddy. If you try to keep him alive and he tries to keep you alive. You don't really have time to think uh, about, you know, Jesus, I'm, doing something for my country. You really are, but you're really right then and there, you're trying to live. And the bond comes, becomes very tight, uh, I think. You wouldn't hesitate to uh, lay your life on the line for them, because they, they do the same thing for you. And how true that is, any veteran knows you would lay your life down for your, sub, uh, your, your soldier next to you, for your brother. I served during the Vietnam War myself, and this is not this program today is not about me, not about my service, but it is dedicated to all the men and women who served in Vietnam. And we did get a a response from several people. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that we got a overwhelming uh, response, but we did get a couple. And we did get one in which we're going to be reading. We did a little research from one of the journalists who were actually on the ground during Vietnam. And that is Bill Plant. Now, Bill wrote this article, and it appears today. And he recounts, in his own words, what happened. And it goes, in late 1964, when I'd been with CBS News a little more than four months, I went to Vietnam for the first time. There were 23,000 American troops there acting as advisors to the South Vietnamese. In two more assignments over the next eight years, I saw American troops go from being advisors to doing most of the fighting. The troop commitment grew to half a million. The military measured progress in body counts, but no matter how many bodies they counted, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong stayed on the offensive. 58,000 Americans died, as did an estimated 5 million Vietnamese. As the American public tired of the sacrifice of lives and treasure, U.S. troops' numbers in Vietnam declined to almost nothing. Then 40 years ago this month, I went back for the fourth time. The North Vietnamese were advancing on Saigon, the capital city of the South. The U.S. was out of Vietnam, but the thousands of U South Vietnamese whose lives were touched by the U.S. presence were not. They lined up in front of the U.S. Embassy, desperate to get out before the communists came, as everyone knew they would. It was time of turmoil and despair. Some of the luckier ones made it to onto U.S. Air Force evacuation flights out of Saigon. Others stormed the walls of the embassy on April 30th, hoping to get on a helicopter to the safety of a U.S. Navy ship offshore. I had left 36 hours before and was able to report on the collapse from Hong Kong. We left behind many who still suffer, veterans, children with birth defects likely caused by chemicals used in the war, and children who s still lose limbs to the bombs and mines left behind. And here at home, 40 years later, the war is a distant memory for most Americans, but not for those whose lives were upended, the wounded, the traumatized, the bereaved. If there's any comfort to be had for the suffering, it's in the considerable efforts both here and in Vietnam at healing the wounds. Those who were touched by the war will never forget it, but I hope they find some measure of peace, and that is courtesy of Bill Plant, at CBS News. The war indeed did touch lives. I was touched. Many others were touched. We cannot forget the sacrifices that were made. 
the countless lives that were lost. But I have to tell you, everyone, not only men suffered from Vietnam, there were nurses there as well. And we have a story of a nurse which will be coming up here shortly in the program. But I want to tell you, Vietnam is always going to be a question mark in history. Why were we there? What was the purpose? Was it justified? It's always going to be a question. But to the men and women who served during Vietnam, there is no question. They did their job. They did it honorably. Many, like Gary Literal, and another honoree of the Medal of Honor, I was born in uh, Henderson County, Kentucky, which is about 90 miles from Fort Campbell. My mother got killed when I was five years old, so I went, moved out on a farm with my uh, grandparents. And when I was about nine years old, my uncle took me down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And we went out on a drop zone and watched a parachute drop. And at the age of nine years old, I looked up and I seen those boys coming out of those airplanes and I said, that's me. And so at that point, I knew what my life was going to be like. I was an advisor to the 23rd Vietnamese Ranger Battalion, consisted of 100 and, 143 Vietnamese Rangers, and they were absolutely warriors to the end. Most of them were grudge fighters. They would lost their wife, their kids, their mothers, their fathers, and they, depending on their religion, most of them, most of them believed if they died honorably, they come back a better person, and so they weren't afraid of death. Me, I didn't believe that. I, I didn't want to get killed. I, I, I didn't want to be reborn the next day a better person. I wanted to stay the person I was. I kind of liked me. And we were moving um, towards the Cambodian border to find the enemy, identify their location, back off, and call in airstrikes on them. And we moved up on top of this one hill to spend the night. And we were surrounded. by the 29th NBA Regiment and the 66th NBA Regiment and the K-6 Sapper Battalion, which consisted of about 5,000 of the North Vietnamese finest. And so it was a 24-hour, four-day fight. It first started with uh, an artillery barrage and which killed um, uh, one of the lieutenants, uh, filled the other and liver full of shrapnel and busted the eardrums of the third sergeant, so I was, I was the only American left after I evacuated those three. Uh, it didn't seem like anyone else wanted to come in and help me. As an American advisor, uh, if you didn't have an American voice on that radio, you got zero American support. You couldn't get any fast movers, you couldn't get any air support at all. And so my main job was to coordinate airstrikes, was to use that radio and get his ammunition in by helicopter, evacuate the wounded that we could. They finally gave up because the fighting was so heavy they didn't, they didn't want to come in and evacuate anyone else. Tried to make two or three runs and uh, drop some ammunition. They did make some high speed low runs and kick some ammunition out to us, but they couldn't land. And uh, so my primary job was, was just command and control trying to get the Vietnamese to stand and fight. On the fourth night, I pretty much had come to the conclusion that I was dead, that it was over. A very quiet, peaceful, tranquil feeling come over. My God and I have our own thing going. We understand each other. And that night I knew that I would probably never see the sunshine. Thank God he didn't take me. He left me here for a reason. I'm not sure I found that reason yet, but there's a reason that I'm here. Well, three years passed and I heard nothing. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, rascals. You know, I'm up there getting my butt kicked and everybody back in the rear is getting bronze stars and silver stars for a little you know, getting in a, in a, in a two, three hour scrap, and here I've been up here for four days and four nights, 
everybody got annihilated and I got forgotten about. You know, and I, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little, little, little upset. And about three and a half years went by and um, I got a call from the Commanding General of the 101st Airborne Division, which I worked in G3. And back then I was a little wild and would pull some crazy things every now and then. And I heard that the Commanding General wanted to talk to me. First thing went through my mind, oh my God, what the hell did I do now? So I went down and, you know, I, I knew him. I'd been, I'd been on that red carpet a time or two. And I walked in, you know, and reported to him, Sergeant First Class Hotel reports. Come over, sit down on the couch. I want to talk to you. I said, boy, I must have really screwed up. I said, he going to take me over, set me down on the couch. Most of the time, he just stands me at attention, chews my butt, and tells me to get the hell out of his office. But we went over and sat down on the couch, and it was General Sidney B. Berry, well, uh, my idol. And uh, he said, uh, we made some small talk, and I'm waiting for him to tell me why he called me in there to chew my butt. And uh, he finally said, uh, well, I want you to know that uh, we just got word from the White House that President Nixon wants you to join him in the White House on the 15th of October uh, so you can be presented the Medal of Honor. The ceremony was, was, was quick. See, my presentation was by President Nixon, and I was right in the middle of Watergate between Watergate and Goodbye. And in between Watergate and Goodbye, things was interesting in the White House. And so I was, I was, uh, I was there, it was hot and heavy. He come in, uh, put the metal around my neck, shook my hand real quick and moved on. He had uh, bigger fish to fry that day than me. But uh, we spent five days there and it was, uh, it was wonderful. We done some nice sightseeing and uh, it was an enjoyable trip. When I come back from Vietnam, we were dirty, filthy, rotten dogs. That's the way society viewed us. I refused to talk about Vietnam. I think my boys seen my reaction when people would ask me about Vietnam. And I think they thought it was probably a safe bet not to ever. But one of these days, I would like for my sons to come up and say, Dad, tell me what you've done in Vietnam. When I think about the Medal of Honor, I realize that I'm wearing this medal for the 400 and some people that died in those four days. I'm their representative. They won this medal. I was selected to wear it for them. And that's a recurring theme that you will hear throughout the day. It seems that everyone who was awarded this country's highest medal have all said they're not wearing it for what they did. They're wearing it for those who fell. That's a recurring theme. You're going to hear it over and over throughout the broadcast today. These men, these women, made huge sacrifices. They were fighting what was commonly referred to as a two-front war. And what I mean by that is not only were they fighting the North Vietnamese, but they were also fighting the ongoing unrest here in the United States. Many of them, when they came back from serving in Vietnam, were called baby burners. They were spit on. They were completely degraded for what they were doing, what they did. We got to remember, folks, this was the 1960s into the early 1970s. It was the era of hippies and peace and love and you know, drugs were rampant, Woodstock, and yet we were fighting a war in Southeast Asia. These men, these women, they served honorably, and they need to be recognized as heroes of the era. It was a tough era, a very tough era for all of us. Any of us who remember those times need to remember and honor all who served and we also have to look at another aspect of this war there were women that's right the women of the nurse corps who were there and i want to read this and i found it 
on a website that is strictly for the women who served in Vietnam. And it goes, like many of the men going over to Vietnam to serve their country, young women from all over the nation volunteered to serve as nurses in the hospitals and medical facilities in South Vietnam. These women volunteered for a variety of reasons, to serve their country, to help the servicemen who were wounded, to receive training and an education, to further their military careers, to prove themselves, or just to have an adventure. The nurses served in the hospital ships of the Navy, the airlift helicopters, the airplanes of the Air Force, and the hospitals and field hospitals of the Army. They arrived in Vietnam with various levels of nursing experience from newcomers to the field with barely six months of nursing under their belts to experienced veterans of 20 plus years. Usually the more confident and experienced the nurse, the better they were able to cope with the stress and the sheer number of casualties they treated on a daily basis. The Vietnam War was the first major conflict to use the helicopter to transport the wounded quickly to medical facilities. Sometimes a man would be in the hospital receiving medical care barely half an hour after he had been wounded. This new medevac system saved the lives of thousands of men who in previous conflicts would have died in the battlefield waiting for medical assistance. Because of this phenomenon, Vietnam nurses were faced with more patients and more severely wounded men than they had seen in previous conflicts. These nurses were required to make quick decisions on who was treated first and what type of treatment they would receive. A much more autonomous state than nursing in the states where they were expected to follow a doctor's orders and nothing more. Combat nurses work 12-hour shifts six days a week, and when a mass casualty incident occurred like a major battle, those 12-hour shifts could easily turn into 24-hour to 36-hour shifts. Nurses also volunteered their time in the communities around them, often going to the local orphanages or hospitals to offer the civilians their medical services or to teach classes on basic hygiene, first aid, or even English. In addition, nurses had to deal with numerous emotions, stress from the amount of patients they had to serve, anger at seeing young men so horribly wounded, and guilt at not being able to save all of the wounded men or make them whole again. Despite the long hours and sometimes horrifying wounds these nurses had to face, many nurses found their service rewarding. They were able to serve their country and save and comfort the wounded men in all their facilities. During the Vietnam War, 98% of the men who served and were wounded and made it to the hospital survived. Nurses witnessed some truly miraculous events such as men recovering from their wounds or acts of true selflessness that are common during combat situations. And many nurses made close friends with their fellow co-workers, some of whom still keep in contact to the present day and we do have elizabeth allen she is a psychiatric nurse who served in vietnam i grew up in huntington west virginia during the days of racial segregation my mother died when i was four from with tuberculosis and my grandmother raised us when schools were actually integrated racially I was sent to the white school by my math teacher because I always wanted to be a civil engineer. God knows I didn't want to be a nurse, but life is a funny place. And it prepares you for those things that are to come if you pay attention. military really worked hard to change my mind. I mean, they actually would send me orders to stateside places and I would turn them back because I really did want to go to Vietnam. Because part of what happens in this country is that people want to be free, but they want somebody else to fight for it. And I know it doesn't work like that.
what people know about Gucci was that the base camp of the 25th Infantry Division sat on top of the tunnels of Gucci. So we had vid calls all the time, not just when they attacked, but all the time. The hospital of Gucci was the only hospital in Vietnam to be overrun by the Viet Cong. And I think that I'm going to be assigned to the GIs. I get assigned to the Vietnamese unit because we had a, a unit that was actually only Vietnamese. And I thought, well, honey, this is where you are. You know, you don't make any decisions. And it was just an open room sort of like this. And the cots were just lined up. I mean, it would be nothing to get 10, 12 in an hour period of time. One of the questions that you get asked a lot is what do you do when a Viet Cong come in? I says the same thing I do if a troop comes. It's not for me to decide. My decision is what do I do with this person? I didn't start, start the war. I don't end the war. But it's my responsibility to take care of whomever comes. I learned a lot in that five months. And we did a lot of things. We did a lot of health care for the population, especially in the rubber plantation, because there were a lot of Vietnamese people who really needed care. They needed all sorts of things. A lot of children who needed a lot. And the U.S. Army did a lot of that kind of stuff. They don't get credit for that. And that is in the words of Elizabeth Allen herself, a nurse who served in Vietnam right near the front lines. Vietnam, for many, they would rather forget about. They would rather just toss it aside. It was a lost cause. It was the only war in the judgment of many we lost. I don't know if we lost. I really don't. You know, granted, we pulled out. I'm not going to say that we left Vietnam a better country. But we have to honor all of those who indeed did fight there. The, the thousands of men who died there. And to those who, to this day, are still classified as MIA, in other words, missing in action. There were prisoners of war. John McCain was one of them. Now, Senator John McCain, former presidential candidate. Secretary of State John Kerry also fought in Vietnam, but he became a very outspoken dissenter of Vietnam. So you have many people today who are serving our country who served in Vietnam and to find out what their thoughts are you'd have to ask them you'd have to you know get inside of their minds I'm not trying to take you back to a time where it will raise concerns or raise issues those issues have been gone over time and time again why we were there you know, were we doing the right thing? You know, was it to fuel the flames of a war machine? This program today is not to discuss that. This is to honor the men like Bruce Crandall, who served in Vietnam. I was born and raised in a very small town where uh, all the neighbors uh, had the right to uh, discipline you and. Uh, no one had uh, locks on their doors, uh, and it was just before the uh, Second World War, and, uh, and of course my dad went off to serve, and my mother became a welder in the shipyard. Those of us that stayed home even, you had to learn what the Japanese airplanes looked like, and uh, you, you would participate in night watches for uh, aircraft. I graduated in 1951. In 1952, in the, uh, I got a letter in the mail that says, Greetings, you've been selected by your friends and neighbors. And I was being drafted. And I went outside and kicked hell out of my two friends. 
and uh, then check my neighbors and none of them had done that so if they ever do start the draft again they got to change that letter it's, it that was a terrible way to find out that I was going in the server in November the uh, NVA uh, hit uh, a, base, a, a camp called play me and, and it was the beginning of an effort to try to cut the country in half they came out of Cambodia and they hit the special forces camp in play me then on a on about the 13th of November we had lifted that siege but we wanted to now hit the enemy that was trying to get out of the country we thought and General Moore uh, was was a lieutenant colonel at the time had the first to seventh camp was t told by his boss uh, that this place would be a good place to go and they put their hand up on the, on the map and it was close to very close to the border of Cambodia and we would catch the enemy before they could get out of, of the country now these assaults were beautifully planned. Uh, it was like the ballet because everything was timed down to the second. When the artillery lifts, they say splash, that means that the last round is in the landing zone. And that's going to be quite small. On the fourth lift in, my second eight aircraft started receiving fire pretty heavy. So up to there, we, we, were, we were not receiving any. And uh, one of my aircraft in the last flight got uh, hit bad enough so it had to be grounded when we got back to, to play me. Well, uh, we refueled and then came back and I'm leading that first eight aircraft. As I'm coming in, we catch all, all sorts of hell. As I'm flaring, there's enemy shooting at us from uh, just outside of our rotors. Uh, they're in the wood line and they're in trees and they're and they're, they're hitting people before they can get off the aircraft. And uh, they shot my crew chief through the throat. They, uh, uh, one of my lieutenants got hit uh, in the back of the head. Uh, and and uh, generally uh, uh, speaking, uh, it couldn't have been worse. We pulled out of there and Moore closed the landing zone. Well, somebody closed the landing zone. I wouldn't have uh, let my next eight aircraft come in under any circumstance at that time. Four out of my eight aircraft had to be grounded back at Play Me. On the way back, I realized that, that there was a real problem in here. And we weren't gonna carry troops in any further, but <clears throat> I better take a look at what's going on personally. And uh, I asked for uh, some uh, another aircraft to go with me once we got on the ground. And I knew we'd go back with ammo, and uh, I knew that uh, with that amount of firefight going on, they would be running short because I knew what they carried in. We averaged two miles a minute, and uh, uh, so it's seven minutes to, to, to go and to come back is another seven. And, uh, and that's too long between. Uh, and so I decided to go to the fire base, which was uh, uh, Falcon, which was only uh, five miles away. I had the ammunition moved. The, Chinooks brought it to Firebase Falcon and I would do the medevac to there. We go back and I, I get out close to the area and I, I call the commander Moore on the radio and said, I'm out, I'm out there. And I said, I've got ammo. He said he needed the ammo. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll bring it in. He says, uh, we'll, we'll cover you as much as possible. So we, we did come in and uh, as, as, as we're making the approach in, we. Uh, Get, we get heavy fire. And the lift before that, when I, I came out, I had three dead and three wounded on my aircraft. Uh, so th this time, we don't have any people, uh, but I start carrying wounded out. And on the next lift in, uh, I, I'd gone to Falcon, and uh, I found two medevac aircraft were there. And, uh, and, and I knew those are the guys that should be carrying out the wounded because my, my crew chiefs and gunners knew first aid. They're not medics. As they were loading the, the boxes of ammo on for the next lift, I went over to the two medic aircraft and said, follow me. And I had my, of course, I feel great. And they, they paid attention. And we took off. I told them, you land exactly where I did. You come in exactly the way I did. So we went in, unloaded the ammo, and got the hell out of there. And in comes the medevac. 
Well, they, they, first off, they came in too high. And then they, the first one got on the ground, and the second one starts receiving fire. And he screams that he's been hit. The most he got out was, was two people, and, and they're gone. And uh, they don't go anymore the rest of the day. And uh, uh, so it, then we came back around and start, started the medevac. By the time he'd completed his 22nd flight, he and his wingman had evacuated more than 70 wounded and helped to ensure the survival of the entire battalion. The Medal of Honor is beyond description for, for a military time. And it was a fantastic experience. The president is so down to earth. I wore my hat to, to, during the ceremony because I, I thought it was the thing to do. And one of the generals in the, in the office there said that he didn't think I ought to do it. And I says, you know, General, I, I, not to be, I'm going to wear it. But you got to remember where this president comes from. And he wears Stetsons. I think he'll love it. And the first calf is at Fort Hood. And I, the president knows that. So he's going to he's going to like that. And he did. He, he, he made a comment about it. I've, I've talked to a lot of young people, and, and when I'm talking to them about heroism and about the medal and, and about service in the country, I try to, to bring it down to their level so they understand that even if they're not going into the military, they still have some responsibility for service, responsibility for the country, responsibility to be good citizens, responsibility to, to, to help where there's help needed. And uh, I think that the military brotherhood and looking out for each other is shared in the civilian sector. A fireman who sees another fireman going into a, a, a building will go with him, whether they're in the same department or not. And, and uh, they'll, they'll help each other and, they'll, and the police will do the same thing. So there's a lot of, of, of that kind of thing. There's a relationship that uh, you just can't explain. But everybody who's ever been in that situation knows what it is. Bruce Crandall received his Medal of Honor during the George Bush era, many years after Vietnam. And as you heard, he saved many lives that day, and it took many years before he was awarded the highest honor this country could bestow on anyone, the Medal of Honor. So when you see someone and you see this medal and you see them wear it, which they do the vast majority of the time, those who have won that medal, that prestigious medal, always remember there's a story behind it, a story of sacrifice, a story that needs to be told. I don't care if it's Vietnam, I don't care if it's Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, what, not Iran, but Iraq. There's a story. There's a story behind it. And every man that wears it will tell you that he's not wearing it for himself, but he is wearing it for his comrades. It's a common theme that you're going to be hearing, a very common theme. But like I said, today we're focusing on Vietnam. It was on this date 40 years ago, 1975, at 12 o'clock to be exact, Saigon fell. And our involvement in Vietnam was completely over. Memories are always going to be there. But it's time we put those memories of those veterans on tape, in video, in some form for the people of tomorrow for the next generation to be made fully aware that yes, we did fight in Southeast Asia. Yes, 58,000 plus Americans died, but yet it is their service, their commitment to what they were doing that brought out so many heroes. And many of the veterans that I spoke to in doing this special have said 
the true heroes are not those who walked away from the battlefield. The true hero is those who fell. Many should have been awarded the same medal, the Medal of Honor. Some of them, you know, they, they figure they deserve it posthumously. There are those stories that we will never hear. But today we're able to give you just a few of the stories of veterans who were there, who received the highest award. And we have a story from a listener of one of our programs, Passionate Justice. And I want to thank Jonathan Wolfman for being able to get this gentleman's story to us. He was a flight surgeon. His name was Rodney Rowe. And I'm going to read the exact email that we received from Rodney. He says, I was a U.S. Army flight surgeon in Vietnam from October 1970 to October 1971 in a small medical de detachment assigned to the 30, 335th and 135th Assault Helicopter Companies. My duties consisted of taking care of all of the fly flying personnel and support personnel in the companies. In addition, I saw combat engineers and MACV personnel who came in looking for medical care. In addition to me, we had about six medics at one, any one time. We saw all of the usual infectious diseases, diseases, and I was responsible for making decisions about whether pilots could fly. From the moment that I arrived in country, there was a curious admixture of the everyday and mundane with the exotic and absurd that constantly amazed me. Here are a couple of examples. I arrived at Tan Sunut Air, Air Base on a Stretch 8 commercial airliner following a 38-hour trip from Oakland, California to Honolulu, Hawaii to Guam to Osaka, Japan to Vietnam. We were loaded onto buses to be transported to Long Bin Army Post. I asked why there were there was hardware cloth screwed into place over the windows and was told that was to prevent children from throwing grenades through the windows of the bus. This reinforced the fact that while the bustling scene outside the bus looked normal, nothing was normal. We slept a couple of days asleep sleeping and waking in barracks getting adjusted to being transported halfway around the world and I bought a 35 millimeter camera. I was warned to get a metal cable for the case instead of a leather strap. We were allowed to go outside the gate to, to shop. When I left the gate there was a leper at the gate begging. He had no fingers or nose. They had fallen off as an effect of leprosy. We had not walked 50 yards outside the gate when a motorcycle with a couple of teenage Vietnamese boys swerved by, grabbed my camera strap, and because I had been warned about thieves grabbing cameras, I had a tight hold on the metal cable. The boy on the back of the bike jerked off. No one was hurt, and the thieves thought it was a huge joke. When I arrived at company headquarters, I asked the commanding officer what my responsibilities were. He told me, your responsibility is to keep your head down, survive 365 days, and go home to your wife and daughter. The war is bullshit. It's a political boogendoggle that no one has the guts to get us out of. Welcome to Vietnam. After I was situated in Dong Tam, I saw, yeah, I saw anyone who came in. The local police chief, mother, anyone. I volunteered at the local orphanage and assisted the Philippine surgeon who worked at the local hospital during surgery. I'm sure we operated on wounded Viet Cong as well as ARVN soldiers. I also had to fly combat missions. I was fortunately never injured. Some of the other members of the helicopter crew weren't so lucky. We had a small concrete block building that sometimes had water standing in the floor that we called the Officers Club. A Vietnamese woman that we called Lucy, but whose real name was Fong, 
was the bartender. Lucy was bright and well-educated. She spoke English, French, Vietnamese, read wildly, and usually said little. One evening, she told me, Doctor, the Viet Cong know you are here. If you get killed, it will be an accident. My first reaction was relief. My second reaction was, how the hell does she know what the Viet Cong know? It was at that point that I realized that the Vietnamese on our army base lived in two worlds. During that year, I saw things that I had never wanted to see again. We flew supplies to patrols, talked, promised to bring more supplies back, and the next day, and went back to find them all dead. I was attacked by a rabid dog. I wasn't bitten, but my medic was and had to get the anti-rabies vaccine. We were subjected to mortar fire. I could awake from a sleep when I heard the characteristic slap of the mortar shell being fired and have my helmet and flak vest on and be in the bunker when the mortar round landed. No joke. The whole experience was surreal. When I returned to the States, I was in Memphis, Tennessee, 24 hours after leaving Vietnam. My wife picked me up and started driving across the Delta country of eastern Arkansas going to her parents' home. It looked much like Vietnam with rice fields and levees. We came to a bridge with no guards patrolling it, and I was on the floor of our car before I could think. Every bridge in Vietnam had guards to keep the Viet Cong from blowing the bridge up. An unguarded bridge meant an ambush. There are so many experiences that I have forgotten or left out for the sake of brevity. And I want to thank Rodney Rowe for that article. Vietnam indeed was a surreal experience. One moment you could see rice paddy fields, you could see levees, and the next it was dense jungle. The heat and humidity in Vietnam is unreal. I could attest to that. There are many times, one minute, you're in a very sweaty condition because of the humidity, and the next, you're in a monsoon. What would appear to be a crick could suddenly become a raging river. This is Vietnam, folks. This is what it was all about. We had to fight the elements. We had to fight the diseases. We had to fight the enemy. This was Vietnam. And there are so many stories out there that even today will never be heard. Because if you ask a veteran, especially one who served in Vietnam, they will remain silent. The reason? They don't want to remember. They don't want those wounds reopened. Many veterans today suffer from the effects of what we call Agent Orange. For those of you who are fully unaware of what Agent Orange is, it was a chemical that was sprayed on the fo uh, forage in order to clear it. But there's been lasting effects. Cancer among the many. And the veterans of that era have been fighting DuPont and fighting the government. Though finally, many are getting the, I should say, treatment. You can't say there's a treatment because it affects the next generation. The side effects of Agent Orange. But yet, I want to say this, this is not really a time of joy in the fact that Vietnam fell. It never will be. So we're going to get back into hearing more from these veterans who were awarded the highest medal our country can offer this time from Sammy Davis I was working at a bowling alley I was I ran the restaurant at a bowling alley and we had a television and there came a very short clip of the president putting the Medal of Honor on Roger Donald and he just you know standing so tall and so straight and now I, because of the military people in my family I was very aware of what the Medal of Honor was and I thought, wow, you know, when I grow up, I'd like to be a soldier like him. Our job was to provide close and continuous support to the infantry. That's the artilleryman's job. So we would sometimes have to fire 
almost continuously for eight, eight or ten hours. As long as the enemy was attacking our infantrymen, you had to do your job. Uh, and then you may lay around for a day or two days and not do much. You, then you cleaned everything and painted everything and polished your bullets. Uh, Sergeant James Gant from Lansing, Michigan, he was the meanest sergeant I've ever seen in my life. And he would make us take each bullet out of our clip every night before it got dark and polish it. He was just a bitter old man. Sergeant Gant was 27 years old. You know, he was, he was just a bitter old sergeant and that's why he was picking on us. So we landed at 8 o'clock in the morning. As soon as we spread the trails on the 105 howitzer, we started firing. And we fired the weapon all day. Just before dark, the enemy broke contact. So therefore, we were able to quit firing. And a helicopter, one of our helicopters, came in and sat down. And a major got out. And he said, your probability of getting hit tonight is 100%. So prepare yourselves. He got back in his helicopter, and away he went. At two o'clock exactly, and I remember because I looked at my watch, we heard mortars sliding down the tube, which is a very distinctive sound, and to hear them sliding down the tube, you gotta be pretty close. And I said immediately, I said, well, when did we move in mortars? And Hart said, we didn't. The mortars were just raining down. And at 2.30 exactly, the mortars quit. It was this eerie, eerie quiet. We looked at each other, and we heard whistles being blown like a coach has and orders being shouted in English. And basically what they were saying was go kill the GI. Sergeant Gant said, okay boys, this is it. So we grabbed a beehive round, set it on muzzle action, loaded it in the tube, and we were standing there at our position ready for him. I was waiting for Sergeant Gant to tell me to fire. Now, I knew not to fire until he said fire, no matter what was happening, and I could see the enemy all around us. They were doing mass assault waves. Then he said fire, and I pulled the lanyard. Well, the weapon went off, did its job, but the enemy had set up a rocket across the, right across the river from me. And when I fired, they fired at my muzzle blast. When it hit the shield, it blew me off the piece. It also hit Sergeant Gant right in the chest. And the last thing I can remember was Sergeant Gant just disappearing into the darkness. Well, the enemy started turning my howitzer around, supposedly to fire, turn it and fire it at our guys. If I'd been awake, I would have known that our next gun back was going to fire a beehive round. Standing rule is you never let the enemy take control of the weapon. You know, common sense. But I was not, I was unconscious. So when the enemy started picking my howitzer up to fire it, Bill Few from Rising Sun, Ohio, fired the beehive. A beehive round effectively turns the 105 howitzer into a shotgun. It fires 18,000 little darts, beehive darts. From mid-thigh up to and including my fourth lumbar vertebra, I had about 30 beehive holes that just passed through me. I had a flak jacket on, which is the only thing that saved my back. When they fired the beehive at me, it woke me up and I rolled over and I rolled face up in the bottom of my foxhole and I'm looking up and I could see all these pretty lights going right over the top of my foxhole and I thought, wow, it's just like Christmas. My hearing went f like turning the stereo from zero to 50. You know, went from hearing nothing within just a very short period of time. It got loud enough that uh, I, my, the smoke started clearing out of my head and I'm starting to realize what's happening and those weren't just pretty lights, they were tracers. So I kind of raised up on one elbow and I looked down and there was 150 to 200 enemy right there. Well, I picked up my M16, I had 12 clips, uh, which is roughly about 180 rounds. And I started doing my job as a soldier. It was just like, like living in a bad dream. You know, no matter what I did, it's like I wasn't doing nothing to them. It was a reinforced battalion. It was 1,500 against 42 kids. And they just kept coming. Well, I fired the last rounds, and I didn't think that I was probably going to see daylight, but I wasn't going to quit. You know, because I thought, well, if, if, if I don't do my job, those guys behind me ain't got a chance. So I thought, well, I'll 
I'll see if I can get off one round from the howitzer. So I scrounged around, found a beehive round, uh, set it on muzzle action, found uh, the canister that had not been fired, had to find the powder because we'd had everything set up nice and orderly and naturally the mortars had blown everything askew. Now the enemy's still doing their job. I mean, they're everywhere. So I was having to hide and lay in the water and they'd run over me. And finally, when I got found all the components and I loaded the piece, I pulled the lanyard. The gun didn't go off. It went, when I pulled the lanyard, it went pop, and my heart just sunk, you know, because this was my last effort. And, but I could feel the gun kind of going. And then it went off, and it went boom. I had overcharged it. Figured I was only going to get one round. I wanted it to be maximally effective, so I filled the canister full of loose powder. Later, they told me, "says Yeah, man, we thought that you had rigged up some kind of big flamethrower or something, because of all that wet powder. That's why it didn't go off immediately." Well, I was still alive. I thought, "Well, maybe I can get off one more round." Well, I one more rounded it uh, until I had heard someone across the river shouting, "Don't shoot! I'm a GI." And I seen Gwendell Holloway, my brother, standing up waving his boonie hat saying, Don't shoot, I'm a GI. And I said, My God, somebody's got to go get him. By this point, my body was in real feeble condition. And I knew I couldn't just run down there and swim across the river. So I thought, well, I'll find an air mattress. That's what the Army had given us to sleep on. So I crawled down to the river, swam across the river, stashed the air mattress in the bushes, and started making back to where I'd last seen Gwendell standing. There was a foxhole there. And instead of just one man being in it, there were three men in it. <sighs> well, I knew I didn't have the strength to make three trips. It had taken me about 45 minutes to make that trip over to that, to that point. And I was just getting so tired. So I asked the man above to give me the strength to carry all three of my brothers at one time. They pulled Jim up on the bank, started doing what they could for him, and I started crawling back to help Bill Fuse guys uh, when I came across my Mino Sergeant again. About half his body was in water, had this big hole in his chest, and he couldn't talk, but he picked his hand up. And I thought, my sergeant wants me to hold his hand. So I kind of crawled up and I grabbed a hold, and I still was hoping that he was going to tell me what to do next, you know. And I grabbed a hold of his hand and I looked down in his eyes. The light bulb that comes on in your head that your daddy always told you about, the light bulb came on. All these things that he had, you know, polishing the bullet, the beehive round, setting the time fuse on it, setting out in 100 degree heat with a blindfold. Sergeant Gant shared with us the things that he knew was going to help us survive. And when I looked down these eyes, I knew that he didn't hate me, that he loved me. You gotta love somebody a whole lot to, to pick on them and teach them things. Jim Deister was one of the last people that we loaded on the helicopters. He was with our dead. Uh, the medic in the helicopter seen a bubble come up through the chest wound that Jim had in his chest. He'd been shot in the chest also and took his stethoscope off and put it on his heart and had a heartbeat. And Jim Deister is alive and well today, living in Salina, Kansas. I got to hold Jim Deister's grandbabies. What an awesome feeling, knowing that if I hadn't done my job when I was just a kid, that this precious little thing would not be here. There were 11 of us left standing that morning out of the 42 that started, 12 counting me. The other 11 men are the men that put me in for this. I didn't do anything heroic. I did my job. That's what soldiers do. And if there was one of these given that night, there should be at least 42 of them. Because if any one of us had not done their job, there would be none of us alive. It's, it sounds silly, perhaps, to say that I went to war and found out about love. What real love is, you know, I didn't go to war to kill people. I went to war because I loved my daddy. I wanted him to be proud of me. I went to war because I loved my grandpas and I love my country. And when I got over there, 
The reason why we fought so hard was because we discovered we loved each other, that we were all we had. And they became brothers. We became brothers. And that's lasted up, you know, it's been 36 years and those men that I fought with are still my brothers. So I, I learned about what real love is. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. My dad and mom uh, were met, they were both uh, in a motorcycle club and they rode Harleys. So we moved out with uh, five Harley Davidsons in 1949 to uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin and settled in Lake Geneva. I had relatives that had been in the various uh, services, uh, the Army, the Air Force, and one in the Navy. Uh, I always enjoyed listening to their experiences in the service and especially the, the whole idea of uh, what it was like to serve, uh, being thankful for what we had in America and giving something back. And so I, I grew up knowing that I would have to give service somewhere, somehow, to help continue on the whole idea of, of maintaining this, this wonderful country we had and the freedoms that it had to offer. And we traveled up the road, got up to uh, Quantaloy without incident, refueled, called down south and said, okay, we're clear, uh, go ahead and start the moving forward with the convoy and we'll log her and, and react if we need to. And we, they did and we started south and uh, when we got to where I thought we would probably be able to maybe snatch up this little NVA that had been sniping at us and get him for intelligence purposes. I started slowing down the, the vehicles that I had, and that's when uh, we got hit. I mean, we were taking some pretty heavy hits. Uh, we had a lot of the vehicles hit. We had 28 people, and uh, almost all 28 were wounded, and vehicles were on fire. And you could just you could see the soldiers. You could see the enemy soldiers they were shooting at us, and the rockets were whizzing by it. Trying to reestablish the defenses, pulling the wounded. Uh, I saw the bodies of my two gunners, uh, and I was off the vehicle, uh, and I was bringing in the bringing in the rear of the column and the, and the front of the column. And the vehicles were being hit, and then just for a moment, and even though everything was going on and people were running around me, and I was giving directions, you know, and I could see my hands moving, and I could I could hear myself talking, but it wasn't me. I was I was just I was another person. I, I saw bullets, and they just seemed to be floating by. I mean, just in slow motion, and it was. Just, it was just as if I, I was there, but I wasn't there. I was watching this, and then I just snapped back again. There, I was back in the middle of a firefight. We uh, we managed to extricate ourselves out of that because the tank platoon came in, and as I looked down the road, I saw the uh, the cavalry guide on the red and white guide on through his cloud of dust, just like the cavalry movies. And and it was uh, Jimmy Caldwell at H Company, and he was he was at our aid there within about an hour and a half hour. Uh, he was down there, and he brought those those big tanks down there and they were beautiful but when they came in they couldn't tell exactly because we didn't have good radio contact with them uh, where we were in relation to the NVA and how many of us were there and how many were the NVA crawling over the vehicles so the lead vehicle stopped just to ascertain what was going on just momentarily stopped momentarily and they were getting ready to come in and I saw that and I didn't know what was going on uh, so I I said I gotta go get them and so I took off running down the road <laughs> Right, right down the middle of the road after the fleet tank. Uh, and uh, that maybe wasn't the best thing to do, but I didn't have any options. I didn't have any radio. Uh, so I ran down there and, the, and then the lead tank uh, blew off his main gun round and, and there was a, a position I didn't know one side of the road was trying to hit the tank. And I was between the tank and the position and he had no choice. And so he fired his main gun and blew me into the brush a bit. And then I crawled back out again and got to the lead tank and, and uh, so, okay, the good guys are in the middle, the bad guys are in the middle, and both flags, and here's where you need to go. And they started maneuvering, and uh, we started suppressing the enemy at that point. We ended up getting some very valuable uh, intelligence information. Uh, we saved the convoy. It didn't get hit. Uh, they would have decimated the gasoline trucks. And, uh, and uh, the North Vietnamese found that uh, we were a little tougher force than they thought to reckon with. My wife gave me an engraved lighter and an engraved watch that I carried with me. Uh, while I was in Vietnam to remind uh, me of, you know, her love for me and, and the need to get back to her. One of the troopers handed me my old lighter that my wife had given me and, and it had been in my uh, left breast pocket uh, and it took a rifle round right in the lighter. And the lighter not been there probably would have hit me in the heart and killed me. I'm not advocating smoking, don't get me wrong, but had I not been a smoker at that particular point in time, uh, maybe I wouldn't be here to tell the story. Leadership in a situation like an ambush is, is something that, that if, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you don't have time to think about yourself. 
I was a 24-year-old lieutenant, and I was one of the older people over there. Most of my troops were 18, 19, and 20 years old. Uh, you're the person they're going to look to for leadership. People on the ground have more experience, been in country longer, but you're the leader. You're the one they're going to look at. And so you've got to give them the example for them to follow, not to fear. Being selected for that particular award, Medal of Honor, is, uh, it's just overwhelming. It just, at first, it's, it's disbelief. You know, this is impossible. It's not a, an award that you go after. It's not a, it's not, you don't become a winner, you're a recipient. Uh, somebody saw that what I did was they felt was appropriate for a recommendation and, they were, and I feel very humble and proud to be a recipient. But again, that's just, uh, you know, something that, that causes me to say, I've, you know, I've got to represent and represent well those that, that this represents. It's that simple. I actually grew up and uh, was, you know, born and raised up in Connecticut, Bethel, Bethel, Connecticut. I spent uh, my first, uh, well, zero to seventeen there, Connecticut, and then I uh, joined the joined the Marine Corps. And of course, being being seventeen years old, I uh, had to get my father to sign for letting me go in the Marine Corps. So, of course, with the problems he was having with me, he didn't have any problems signing. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing is, he says, you didn't make it, you don't make it in the court, make sure you don't come back. <laughs> they said, well, you're going to re-enlist? I said, no, 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 no. I'm going, you know, back to Connecticut. And, you know, I'm out, man. I did my five. And then I started thinking, all this training, all this training, all this training, you know. And it felt, I felt like the heavyweight champion, or, you know, the challenger. You know, I did all this training and did all this fighting and did all this sparring and all. You know, I now I have a chance to get in the ring with the heavyweight champion of the world, you know, to see who I really am, you know, because you don't know until you get in there, you know, same with combat. And I said, uh, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I got 60 days to do now in the Corps. I'll extend a year. Give me three, give me a 30 days leave and then send me to Vietnam, you know, so I just, I, you know, I just have at a point where I was in, in my life and my age and my rank and everything, I had to prove to see where I really was. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably never, if I, if I wouldn't have did that, I'd go to the grave not knowing if, you know, are you, are you a real Marine or, a, or, or an imposter? I had to be a blocking force for tanks that were sweeping towards us, you know. And uh, so they wanted me to take my squad, reinforced, go down to a certain coordinates, move in, tie in with the river, bring the snipers with you. So we went down the road and got in there and got, I got in position and everything and the tanks, the company was sweeping towards us and all of a sudden one of the tanks hit a, must have been a rock mine or some kind of mine and blew the track or the dry wheel off one of the tanks. I couldn't even see them, they're way, you know, like 3,000 meters to the tree lines over that way. And then, uh, so they said, well, we got to fix the tank, we can't leave it here, you know, we're, so we're going to hold what we got and get this tank repaired and then it all depends on how long it takes us to get it repaired, we're going to move towards you. So just hold what you got now. And then, then, of course, 12 o'clock rolled by, and, and then 1 o'clock rolled by, 2 o'clock. One thing about Vietnam, you don't want to be out on the round in the area when it's dark out, because them dudes, when it's light out, and all them bird dogs and all them planes and all them observation planes are in the air, they don't want to get caught in the open, the enemy. But once the lights come off, you know, now it's still area. About four o'clock, how's it coming? Well, we're almost finished, but it looks like we're gonna pull out of here. We're gonna go back, you know, because we didn't got enough time to get to you and then we're gonna lose, a, you know, it's getting night and everything. I said, okay. Then I, I tried to get in the medevac as quickly as I could. They said, well, well we, got, we got a slick coming in to pick up the, the wounded. You're gonna have to keep the KIAs with you. Uh, we haven't got enough room here, so. They took the wounded away. They didn't take the gear, they didn't take the flak jackets, they didn't take the helmets, they just took the three guys, you know, the wounded ones. Left me with the, the gear for three and dead dead marine there. So I said, hey, we gotta get moving out of here. Cause we're gonna take this body with us. We started off the hill, started moving into the patties, moving along. Holler up to me, Sergeant Kellogg, look up back on the hill where we just come off of. I said, I look back up there and I see all these you know, Vietnamese and everything up there, you know, just watching, wondering what the hell's going on here. They said, you want to shoot at them? I said, don't shoot, don't shoot. They're going to pin us down here. We got a, we got another thousand yards to get to the road. One of the things I really started thinking about real close was they saying, you know, one Marine can kick 
like 10 or more enemies' butts, you know, and I said, uh-oh, we're gonna find out tonight <laughs> if that's true or false. President Nixon gave me the medal in the White House ceremony. There's about four or five of us got them all at the same time. It was a, it was a good thing to have, you know, being around all my you know, fellow combatants and everything, you know. It's, and they've been, you know, they've done, they've done a lot of stuff too, so, you know, it's sort of one of these, we survived. <laughs> You know, freedom's not free. There's a lot of people losing their lives for people to be living the way they are today. You know, like they say, you know, until you fight for it, you know, price of price of liberty is, is nobody will, if you never fought for it, you're never gonna really understand what it means to people, you know. I was an army officer's son, so um, uh, my father served in World War II. I grew up elementary school, California, nursery school, Hammond, Indiana, then from California, we moved to Germany, 1949. From Germany, we moved to Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, Indiana. In Indianapolis, Indiana, I moved to Japan. From Japan, back to St. Louis. From St. Louis to West Point, and from West Point, then I took my own international career. My father was one that made it very clear that I was gonna get good grades. Uh, he told me he would drop me off at West Point and then he would come see me when I graduated. And uh, he expected me to fulfill whatever my potential was in all the areas of military life. Then he gave me Delta Company, third of the 187th, a newly formed company, and I was the only person in it. I would form up in formation, do all the reports, Delta Company all present and accounted for, sir. I'd pass in review <laughs> alone. And then he started filling me up with the rejects of all the other units. We had the reputation, we were called the clerks and the jerks. And I used to think, my God, I have a few very, very smart guys and a lot of really mean guys. What a great group to go to war with. And that unit ended up being one of the most highly decorated units in all of Vietnam. I remember asking them early on, I said, look, if you had your choice of company commanders, you wouldn't pick me. But if I had my choice of soldiers, I'd pick you. So, I have the advantage. I said, I don't know what Vietnam's like, because I'm the only non-returnee in this group. But if you'll trust me, I'll bring you all home. After we resupplied, I said, okay, reform, push into the jungle, let's keep going. And the LERP unit went about a quarter mile into the jungle said they saw people carrying water containers. They started hearing noise and they asked permission to recon by fire. And I gave them permission to do it just as it was getting dark. And the whole mountain opened up. And it looks like we stumbled across a reinforced battalion of NVA regulars, along with a um, remnants of a VC regular unit, the Dong Nai Regiment. The LERP group was engaged, and my medic, Doc Moore, said, Sir, I'll see you later. I think I got some patience. And he ran up to the front. And one of the guys come back, said to me, he said, Sir, there, there's a Y in a tree with a bunker or something behind it, but everybody's pinned down. And uh, I said, What do you mean a Y in a tree? He says, It's a Y in a tree. You can't miss it. So I ran forward with my RTO. And I guess what had happened is they'd had a machine gun at ground level and a guy with an automatic weapon up in the tree so you were getting fire from up and down and as our guys came into this very small clearing it's when they pinned them down I just came around the corner started throwing hand grenades when the weapon stopped I looked around and stood up no one was firing at me I figured that's it and um, I got back they said where's the Y in the tree I said there's no more Y in that tree we were 89 of us and probably had 15 cut off or had been killed. And I said, just go into an area. Everybody down, form the perimeter as best you can and let's find out how many we got left and where we are. We were beyond artillery, so I couldn't bring in any supporting fires. Uh, helicopters were above, started coming in and all of a sudden the mountain would open up firing at the helicopters, which usually the first sign that this is not a small unit. And so for the next four or five hours, it was just us firing off against others, firing in, 
hoping to hell they weren't going to just decide to overrun our little 25 yard by 10 yard position. I remember leaning down next to this rock saying, now we're all going to die. My mom's going to be asked, where'd your son die? And she'll say, well, where did your son die? And someone will say, Normandy, <clears throat> Quezon, the Argonne. And she'll have to say, coordinates X, Y, Z. Because there wasn't a name for this damn place. Right then, this young kid who had just joined us on when we were getting the refueling, he says, sir, we're kicking the hell out of them, aren't we? <laughs> and I started laughing. And I said, well, you know, I guess we are. I mean, we were down with fire everywhere, and we were firing with little fire and ammunition we had left. We were trying to conserve it. And all hell was raining down on us, and this kid thought we were winning. And uh, <clears throat> I remember thinking, okay, it's going to get dark. We better do something. So I said, if they knew how small we were, we'd be finished. So I had everybody move out and put claymores out, distributed hand grenades to everybody, and I said, I'm going to yell out numbers. One, two, three, and this, to reflect the hands of a clock, the hours. And if I say three, six, then number three and number six, throw a hand grenade. And I don't care where you throw it, just throw it. And we're going to do this all night long. And the rest of the night, though, every plane in war zone D and C came to visit us. Every helicopter, every Aussie Canberra jet, every Air Force plane. The dragon came in, he says, I can do things, can you put out some lights? I said, I don't have any lights. And then my brigade commander says, I'm coming in. And he chopped a hole in the canopy with his helicopter and says, throw on the most critically wounded and got them out. And he kicked off some beanbag lights for me so we could mark our perimeter. Next morning, we got everybody out and I saw my first KIAs that were my men. I remember thinking, I asked them to trust me, and I promised them I'd bring them home. And uh, those ten guys did, but I didn't. And uh, every every day of my life, I think back what I could have done better that night. What could I have done to bring those ten home? I guess in April of um, 70, I got a call from a sergeant telling me that my DSC had been upgraded to a Medal of Honor. And I told him I didn't deserve it. He said, what's that mean? I said, I think I'm going to turn this down. And he said, if I can be blunt, he said, it's not yours to turn down. He said, this belongs to your men. You wear it for them. To this day, I know I don't deserve it. And after all, 10 guys had died. And almost everybody who was there that night was wounded to some degree. I just didn't think that's the stuff of which medals are made. And as a result, when I'm around the other Medal of Honor recipients, I consider myself a visitor. As a young army officer, compared to a business or anything else, you have the opportunity, the burden and the privilege, to look a young man in the eye and ask him to go do something. And they know what you're asking them to do in all likelihood means they're not coming back. And these American soldiers look in the eye and they wink and say, got it, sir, and grab their weapon and off they go. And. Um, that is such a privilege to wear that uniform and to be the old man, if you will, at the age of 23 or 24, that there's nothing in life that compares to that responsibility and that privilege. Nothing. And you have only heard just a few of the recipients of the Medal of Honor today. In closing, I want to thank everyone 
man, every man, every woman who served our country during the conflict in Vietnam. And I also want to thank uh, Paul Colivan of the band Born and Bred, who wrote a song that I felt was very, very appropriate for the closing. Today, 40 years ago, Vietnam fell. And I want everyone out there, when you see a veteran, I don't care if he served in what war, remember the sacrifices they have made so you could enjoy the freedoms you have today. With that, I wish you all a very good day. The embassy painted the rosiest picture you could ever imagine. They're fighting well, they're strong, they're courageous. They have the country's interest at hand and they can turn the North Vietnamese back and, and they're in great shape. They were trying to convince us, the Congress of the United States, to send more money to Vietnam, that Vietnam was really a good government and succeeding. And it's not wholly unlike what our government has been saying to us about Iraq uh, recently. You always get government people uh, refusing to face the real truth if it's embarrassing to what the administration wants to do. The thing I saw in all of our visits there were that the Vietnamese wanted a, a reunited country. They weren't up to fighting for what America thought was so crucial. They didn't like communism, but they weren't going to fight. And I, I've always felt that any money that we had given or any more military assistance, tanks, artillery, planes, bombs, none of that would have sur uh, survived against the North Vietnamese. They said, look, we don't trust the reporting coming out. Would you please send us separately a telegram describing what you see as the psychological atmosphere there on the ground, in the embassy and out on the streets? And I said, I'll do it. Uh, I'll file it through my USIA channel. I said, but 24 hours, Graham will have read it, and that will be the last one you're going to get out of me, only because he will have stopped me. We need that. So I filed it. Uh, the last line, as I recall it, of the cable was indicative of all that preceded it in the cable. There is fear out there bordering on panic. I would get back to my villa late at night or whenever, and there would be 15, 20, 25 people outside the gate. And they'd come in and, you know, you're the minister for this, and, and our, we've been loyal to the U.S., uh, we're in sensitive positions, please get me and my family out. And you would say, we can't. And uh, they would fall sometimes to their knees. And, and when I use the word grovel, I mean, that's what they did. And they would say, never mind me, get my wife, my children, my mother, my father out, please. I think it's the worst thing emotionally that I've ever encountered. As an adult, dealing with other adults who thought you were some kind of a power bastion that could save them from one of their worst fears. They saw us as what we were, the power. They knew we were the power behind whatever government was uh, then in office, uh, and the next one and the one after that. They knew that we were the financial uh, providers, if you will, of the economy, uh, and they knew we were powerful. I, I can think of no other episode during what was for me the worst nine months of my government career for a lot of reasons, not the, not just the eventual outcome. I can think of nothing that hit me with the wallop that that did. I mean, there's a point at which everything just falls apart. But that didn't change the ultimate fact that there were key locals, Vietnamese, to whom a commitment had been made and where we failed in the commitment. Had we moved earlier, and uh, started evacuating more of them sooner, we might have gotten more of them out. You know, it was clear that the end was coming within hours. So at four o'clock in the morning, the ambassador and I went to the communications station in the embassy 
and we wrote right there and the communicator was typing out the message on the machine uh, said, uh, s sent our last message which said uh, plan to close embassy at about 4.30 local time uh, due to the necessity to destroy the communications gear this will be the last message from embassy Saigon there were a lot of uh, panicky people and we were trying to keep them calm trying to assure them that yes there was a steady stream of helicopters coming eventually you would get in line and eventually you would get out you just had to be a little patient the helicopters would usually hold maybe 38 marines combat loaded we we're putting 60 or 70 Vietnamese in these helicopters we were just packing them in as quickly as we could we did that from like 3 in the afternoon till maybe 4 in the morning all afternoon all night long and it was just a steady stream we barricaded the building on the first floor and there were gates on every floor of the stairwell we locked all of the stairwells well in about five minutes some of the Vietnamese had broken through the doors they had taken one of the fire trucks that we had there at night they took those vehicles and they smashed through the doors of the embassy. The top stairwell, we barricaded it with foot lockers. And every once in a while, we would throw a little can of, of uh, CS gas or something to try to clear the stairwell. And we just kept that barricaded up. Some of the people in the stairwells were crying for us. They were holding their hands up and like praying to us to let them in, and we just couldn't let them in. There just wasn't any room for them got on the roof and we stayed on the roof and then we were waiting for our helicopters and nothing happened. We didn't have any guarantee that we were going to be rescued or the helicopters were going to come for us. We had plenty of ammunition, we had all of our rifles. If we had to do whatever we had to do, we, would, we had the equipment, we had the machine guns, we had the power to fight if we had to. But we were all just dead tired. We had been up all night evacuating people. We were just very physically exhausted at that time. We sat there for about two hours, um, and then the sun started coming up. It got eerily quiet, very, very quiet. It was like a quiet before a storm. I remember being in sixth grade, 11 years old, and watching the war on television. And it just felt surreal that here I was 10 years later, witnessing the death of a nation. This is NBC Nightly News, Wednesday, April 30th, with John Chancellor reporting from the NBC News Center in New York and David Brinkley's Journal from Washington. Good evening. The city of Saigon was renamed today. The victorious communists who forced the city's surrender said the capital of South Vietnam henceforth will be known as Ho Chi Minh City. Left my heart to the sappers round Kaysan And I sold my soul with my cigarettes to the black market man I've had the Vietnam cold turkey From the ocean to the silver city and it's only other vets would understand About some long forgotten dark side guarantees How there's no V-Day heroes 1973 And how we sailed into Sydney Harbour Saw an old friend but I couldn't kiss her She was lying and I was home to the lucky land She was like some man and mom from that time on the lives were all so empty till they found their chosen one. The legs were often open, but the minds were always closed, and the hearts were held with fast suburban chains. And the legal pads are yellow, how was long pay packets lain? And the telex riders clattered where the gunships once had been. But the car park makes me jumpy. And I never stop the dreams Or the growing need for speed and cocaine 
So I worked around the country from end to end Tried to find a place to settle down Where my mixed up life would mend I held a job on an old rig Flying choppers when I could But the nightlife nearly drove me round the bend And I travelled round the world from year to year And each one found me aimless one more year worse for wear Been back to Southeast Asia But the answer sure ain't there And I'm drifting north to check things out again You know the last plane out of Sydney's almost gone In only seven flying hours I'll be landing in Hong Kong There's nothing like the kisses From a jaded Chinese princess Gonna hit some Hong Kong mattress all night long Well, the last plane out of Sydney's almost gone Yeah, yeah the last plane out of Sydney's almost gone And it's really got me worried Going nowhere and I'm in a hurry The last plane out of Sydney's almost gone Yeah, the last plane out of Sydney's almost gone yeah, the last plane out of Sydney's almost gone.